right, yeah, please remain standing for the reading of scripture, if able, if not, stand on the inside, and only trust him, what a great uh, theme for us this morning, and I know a lot of you might be concerned on the timing, I just thought, well, canceled all our plans anyway, we might as well just shelter in place, right. and, and let the preacher preach, so, <laughs> all right, looking forward to it, John 21, uh, verses 1 through 7. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and on this wise showed he himself. They, there were together Simon Peter and Thomas, called Didymus, and Nathanael of Cana in Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, and two other of his disciples. Simon Peter saith unto them, I go a fishing. And they say unto him, We also go with thee. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately, and that night they caught nothing. But when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Then Jesus saith unto them, Children, have ye any meat? They answered him, No. And he said unto them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. They cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved saith unto Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girt his fisher's coat unto him, for he was naked, and did cast himself into the sea. You may be seated. All right, well, oh, I got, I got one already, thank you. I came prepared, the tear juice, we're ready to, <laughs> gotta replenish, all right. Um, yeah, well, it's already been, it's, it's been a, it's been a good church service already. I'm glad I was able to be here. <laughs> thank you for bearing with, with us through all that. And I, you know, the day may come when we just have a Sunday morning that is just a prayer time. But if I'm around, there'll at least be a devotional at the end of that. <laughs> um, I am going to move sort of quickly through this. I, I started even praying last night about, as I it became increasingly clear that we were going to devote a larger than normal percentage of our service to praying about what the Lord wanted done with the outline. Um, the message this morning is, is, really, is really specific. Um, the title of the message you've got it there in your outline is, uh, Do You Love Me? And, and really the focus of this message is on how God restores our relationship with him when, when we break it. Um, I, I believe that once you get saved, that it's Jesus that saves, not us. Amen. And so, so I believe that when Jesus saves somebody, that, that there's no taking that back. That Jesus knows all about you. He, all the things that you did that were a surprise to you were not a surprise to Jesus. So you did not trick God into buying you. It's not like Jesus bought you with his blood on the old rugged cross and got you home and a week later you broke and he thought, oh man, I got a lemon. No, he knew. He knew how broken you were when he bought you. So I don't believe that Christians can lose their salvation. I believe that once Jesus buys you, that you're his. But I do know that we can get very out of sorts with God sometimes, can't we? We can, we can really damage that relationship. Evangeline will always be my daughter no matter her special needs, no matter the tantrum she might have, she's still my kid. Hugo will always be my son. No matter what he does. Now, how well we're getting along or how well we're not getting along depends on both of us a little bit, doesn't it? Because sometimes dad's just having a rough day. Sometimes he's having a rough day. Sometimes we're both having a rough day. He's still my kid. In our relationship with God, 
How many of you are grateful God never has a rough day? God's never, you know what? It's been a long week. Just don't have time for this right now. Never. Isn't that good? But what do we do when we get out of sorts with God? How does God bring us back around? I actually, when I was deciding if I wanted to preach this message and I was praying about it, I'll tell you my concern and then we're going to pray and get into it. My concern was that there might only be a handful of people in the church really right now that are in really great need of this message. But th- what I b- believe the Lord spoke to my heart about was that, that those people that, do, that are <clears throat> right now in great need of this message are in great need of it. And sometimes you leave the 99 and you go after looking for the one. And then as I put the message together, I realized that all of us in, in ways, sometimes smaller ways or sometimes bigger ways, we just go through seasons of life where we end up in a, in a time when our relationship with the Lord is not what it used to be or not what it once was. It's gone a little bit cold, maybe. And, and I would just encourage you, if right now you would say, hey, my relationship with Jesus is going great, fire on all cylinders, we're doing good, file this message away for later when you hit the next bump in the road. And for those of you that are maybe really going through it right now, I think Jesus pushed this onto my heart for you. Okay, let's pray and then we'll get right into it. God, we just thank you again for today and the chance to be here, to be together with your people. Thank you for all the things that you provide for us. Thank you for your constant faithfulness and goodness and thank you especially for your love for us. God, I don't know why I don't trust you as well as I should. Because you deserve to be trusted. Help us to trust you better. To know that we can run back towards you even when we've wandered far away. Help us this morning, help me. In Jesus' name we ask, amen. All right, as I follow along the bulletin, if you'd like, we'll fill some blanks in as we go along. The background of this sermon series, as you are familiar with by now, of course, is that God already knows everything. There's no bit of information that, to which we can give God that he does not already have access to. Therefore, when God asks a question, he is not looking for information. If God has asked us a question, if God has asked anyone a question, that question is designed for their benefit, to make us think about something, to make us consider something we maybe have not considered before. And the omniscience of Jesus Christ, his all-knowingness, is one of the great evidences of his divinity. Jesus Christ is not just a good man. He is not just a prophet. He is God the fullness of the Godhead dwelt in bodily. So, as we come to our text here in John chapter 21 and verse 1, we read it just a moment ago. It begins by saying, after these things. It's a great way to start a story. (laughs) After these things. Verse 1 says that Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And on this wise showed he himself. In other words, and this is how it happened. I want to remind you what the after these things, things are. Most notably to our sermon today is that one of the things that has just happened is that Peter has denied even knowing Jesus, not once, not twice, three times. Peter who said that he would, though all men deny thee, Though all men forsake thee, I will never deny thee. I will never forsake thee. I will go with thee even unto death, Peter said. But after these things, he denied him three times. Matthew 26, then Peter began to curse and swear, saying, I know not the man. And immediately the cock crew, 
And Peter remembered the words of Jesus, which had said unto him before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And so Peter went out and he wept bitterly. That's not the only thing that's happened. Jesus has been abandoned by almost all of his followers from crowds down to three people at the foot of the cross. His mother, Mary, and just one of the disciples, just John. Jesus has been falsely accused and lied about by the people that were supposed to be God's ambassadors. Jesus has been hung out to dry. He has been politically sacrificed for the convenience of the powerful, knowing that he's innocent, but it's too much trouble to try to get justice, so they send him to be crucified. Jesus has been killed, not by the cross. When the soldiers came to break his legs, they found that he was already dead, killed not by the crucifixion, <clears throat> killed by the sins of the whole world, killed by my sins. Jesus has been buried in a borrowed tomb. That's a pretty grim after these things. The story doesn't stop there. After these things includes Christ's resurrection back to life. I mean, that's a rough week that Jesus had, but that was not the end of his story. Jesus has triumphed over every single one of these disasters and has left an empty tomb behind him. After these things, after the resurrection, now Jesus has begun the rebuilding of the disciples' faith. You see, Jesus has triumphed over this, but the disciples have had a rough go too, not like Jesus, but they believed in him. And some of the things they believed, they didn't really understand. And you read the Gospels, you'll see Jesus trying to prepare them and say, it's not going to go this way. The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men. The Son of Man must be betrayed and crucified, but he'll rise the third day. And you can read it in the Scriptures and almost see the words go right over their heads. In this year and out the other side. And so when it begins to happen, they are filled with terror and doubt they flee and scatter and hide to the point that even as the reports of his resurrection begin to come in, the women have seen him at the tomb. Peter has seen him at the tomb. Disciples have seen him along the way. They're still struggling to believe. On Sunday evening, John chapter 20, it's in your outline that same day at the evening being the first day of the week, so Sunday evening, when the doors were shut and the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, they've heard reports that Jesus is alive. They've heard from the women that Jesus lives. They don't believe it yet. Peter's seen the empty tomb, but not Jesus. They're in hiding still. Sometimes I think we forget the way that this timeline actually goes. We get together on Easter morning and we, sometimes Christians will meet at sunrise or we get, we get all excited and we put on our nicest suit or our nicest clothes and we come to church and we get excited about the food and we get together and it's Easter Sunday. He lives, he lives, he lives. It's my favorite Sunday of the year. I love it. But Easter Sunday, they, they heard the reports but struggled to believe them. So by, the, by Sunday evening, still the disciples are still in hiding. The doors are shut, they're assembled for fear of the Jews, and into this group of terrified disciples, Jesus appears. Jesus came and he stood in the midst, and he saith unto them, Peace be unto you. And we had so said, he showed them his hands and his side. I mean, can you imagine him? Mean, here he comes. They spent three years with him, but they, they watched him die. He's been dead for three days. He shows back up and he says, Peace, and they're like, We want to see some proof. <laughs> And so he does. Why? 
because he remembers that we are dust. He is sympathetic to what it is that they have been through. Even though they have scattered from him, even though they have abandoned him, even though they have betrayed him, the Gospels tell us that Jesus, having loved his own, loved them to the end. It did not change the way Jesus felt about them. And now he has undertaken after his resurrection to begin rebuilding their faith. And so he showed them his hands and his side. And the disciples were glad when they knew it was the Lord. After these things, the, Jesus has begun rebuilding their faith, and now Jesus is going to recommission them for service. You recall as you read through the Gospels that Jesus has called them to come and serve. Jesus has commissioned them to go out and serve. But after the, their collapse and failure, Jesus is rebuilding their faith, and he is again commissioning them again to start over. In that same passage as Jesus appears to them, in verse 21, Jesus said unto them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. They have not failed him to the point where he's going to find new disciples. He's sending them again. This he said, and he breathed on them, and he said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Now we know that the fullness of the Holy Spirit is going to come at Pentecost. But Jesus here imparts the Holy Ghost into them, commissioning them for the work that he's going to send them to. After these things. This sets up our story. All of this has occurred. Christ's death, his resurrection, his rebuilding of their faith, his recommissioning them for service. All that has transpired by the time we reach verse 2. Where the story again picks up with Simon Peter. And I want to remind you that he was given his name by Jesus. Look at verse 2 with me. There were together Simon Peter. Now why, does, why is Simon Peter, why is it done that way? His parents named him Simon. But Jesus saw him and said, I'm going to call you Peter. So it's Simon Peter... He's not alone. Also with him is Thomas, the, Thomas Didymus, the disciple, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, James and John, and two other disciples that are not named. These disciples are gathered together here as our story begins. I just remind you of Jesus' naming of Peter. It's in John 1. And he, his brother Andrew brought Simon to Jesus. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah, but thou shalt be called Cephas. In the Greek, it's Kephas. It means stone, which the Bible tells us by interpretation is a stone. But the word, the second word for stone is Petrus or Peter. So Peter ends up, and sometimes in the Bible you see him called, you'll see him called Simon Peter or even uh, Cephas Peter or Simon Cephas. It gets turned around. They're all names for Peter, but it means a stone. I want you to hang on to that, that Peter got named by Jesus. Because we're going to focus, there's much we could preach on this message today, but we're zeroing in in these verses on Peter. And because in verse 2 and 3, we, we see that Peter is going back to his beginnings. When Jesus called Peter, when Jesus renamed him, when Jesus found him, he was a fisherman. And here in verse 3, after all that's happened... Now remember, Peter's seen the empty tomb. Peter's seen Jesus in the upper room. Peter's been recommissioned by Christ. He's been given the Holy Ghost by Christ. But here, after these things, Peter says, I'm going to go fishing. Now maybe they needed food. Maybe he's uncertain he can really live up to Christ's call on his life. And Simon Peter saith unto them, I go a fishing in verse 3, and they, the other disciples that are with him, say, we also go with thee. Peter was always a leader in the group. The things that Peter did, he was often out in front, and other people looked at what he was doing and followed him. And so as he goes fishing, these other men go with him. 
They went forth, they entered into a ship immediately, and that night they caught nothing. Parallels when Jesus first met him. This story is a very strong echo of when Christ called Peter. He met Peter before and renamed him on his first meeting, very bold, very Jesus. But Peter continues to fish. Jesus renames him, but Peter's not yet become a follower of Christ. And so later, if you read through the Gospels, you'll see later, Jesus is teaching by the sea and Peter is there cleaning his nets. They've fished all night and they've caught nothing. And Jesus says, can I use your boat to fish, to preach from? And so Peter lets Jesus use his boat and he goes out and he preaches. And at the end of that, Jesus says, hey, why don't you, why don't you try fishing again? And they say, well, Lord, we've fished all night and we've taken nothing. It's out of this incident that Jesus calls Peter to follow him. It's there in your outline, Matthew 4, 18. Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew's brother, casting the net into the sea, for they were fishers. It's, it's what Peter knew. And his life has been very changed these last three years. But out of the trauma of the last week, he's gone back to what he knew. But in verses 4 and 6... We're going to find this echoes of Peter's first astonishment at the power of God. Look at verse 4 with me. When the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore. But the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. So Jesus saith unto them, children, have you any meat? And they answered him, no, and children, and young men. It's a flexible term in the Greek. So you get the picture. Peter's seen Christ but is still, for some reason, unready to go back to just serving the Lord, un unready to go back to the life Christ has called him to. So he's gone back to his roots. He's gone back fishing. And so he and six other disciples, they, they go out and they fish all night and they don't catch anything. And so early in the morning, the sun's coming up. They're getting done fishing. They're getting ready to head to shore. And here comes this man. It's Jesus. They don't know it yet. Jesus comes very early in the morning along the shore. And he calls out, young men, do you food? And the answer comes back, no. So Jesus yells to them, verse 6, cast the net on the right side of the ship and maybe it'll work. No. Cast on the right side of the ship and you'll find. And Jesus said, no, the fish are on the right side of your boat. <laughs> and these men, I think they've seen enough even without recognizing that it's Jesus, they throw the, note, the nets on the other side and are not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. They can't get the net back in the boat. This is, again, just like when Simon first got called by Christ. It's in your outline, Luke 5. Simon answering said to him, Master, we've toiled all the night. We've taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I'll let down the net. And when they had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes. And I want you to note this, the net broke. When Jesus first called Simon, he said, throw it on the other side. He did so many fishes, they broke the net. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees and said, depart from me for I am a sinful man, O Lord. He is astonished and all that were with him at the draught of fishes which they had taken. Peter's, Jesus is, I believe, uh, this cannot be a mistake. Peter's been so shattered by his own betrayal of Christ that he's gone back to the beginning and now Jesus has met him back at the beginning. He's out in a boat catching nothing. And Jesus says, try the other side. And so Peter does. And just like when Jesus called him, again, they catch so many fish they cannot draw the net. Now, there's no indication this time that the net broke. In fact, the Bible is going to tell us later that it specifically did not break this time. That's a different sermon. We see another echo here in verses 7 to 8. It's like Peter's triumph. One of the greatest moments in Peter's life, probably the greatest, is when he's the first to recognize who Jesus is. But in my mind, one of Peter's, one of the highlights of Peter's life 
is when they're afraid they're going to drown out in the sea. And then through the storm, walking on top of the wind and the waves, comes Jesus out to them walking on the sea. And they see him again. They don't recognize him at first, just like this story. They don't recognize Jesus at first across the waves. But Peter says, Lord, if it's you, call me to come to you. And Jesus says to Peter, come. And this man threw himself over the side of a boat in the middle of the storm. That's pretty good. And I know what happened next, and so do you. But he got over the side of that boat in a storm. I want you to see what happens now in this story. Here, after these things, Peter's out fishing again, catching nothing. Jesus says, throw it on the other side. He does. Such a draw of fish, he can't catch it. And he recognizes now that it's Jesus. Look at verse 7. Therefore, the disciple whom Jesus loved, that's John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, saith unto Peter, it's the Lord. And when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girt his fisher's coat unto him, for he was naked. Now, naked in the Greek sense means he didn't have any other clothes, just his undergarment. When he saw it, he girt his fisher's coat upon him, and he cast himself into the sea. Realizing that it's Jesus, again, Peter throws himself over the side of a boat. It doesn't appear this time that he walked on water. This time he went in it. But they were not far, the Bible tells us, from land. But as it were, 200 cubits dragging the net with the fishes. Peter leaves the fish again for Jesus. Matthew 4, 28, Peter answered and said to him, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And Jesus said, come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water. Back to Peter's beginnings. Back to Peter's call. Back to one of Peter's great high points. In verse 9, we see another echo again of previous meals where Jesus provides. You recall that the story begins with Jesus saying to them, hey, do you have any food? But Jesus didn't really need their food. By the time they get ashore, Jesus already has the fishes he didn't need him to get him out of the lake for him. Look at verse 9. As soon as they were come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid thereon, and bread. And Jesus said to them, bring of the fish which you have now caught. Simon Peter went up, and he drew the net to the land, the full of great fishes, 153. That's a very interesting number, and not something we're going to get into in this sermon today. <laughs> The point is that it's a lot of fish for one net. And for that there were so many, yet the net was still not broken. Jesus saith unto them, come and dine. And none of the disciples durst ask him, who art thou, knowing that it was the Lord? Sometimes people wonder about why it is that people struggle so much with recognizing Christ after the resurrection. The Bible tells us the answer to that that in bearing the weight of our sins on that cross, the Bible said that his visage, that his face was marred more than any man. In the resurrection, you and I will have perfect bodies. There will only be one wounded body in heaven. And it belongs to Jesus. There will only be one set of scars and only one ruined face. And it belongs to Christ. The disciples knew that it was him. They've met with him the previous evening in the upper room. But they're still in this, this kind of overwhelmed awe. They're, they don't know what to say to him. You ever been around somebody you did wrong to? You've done them wrong, and then all of a sudden you're kind of thrust back together again. And, or maybe they've done you wrong, or maybe both. It's a little hard to figure out what to talk about, isn't it? Sometimes that elephant is so big in the room that it's hard to make chit-chat. But they knew who he was. So before Jesus says anything, 
before he begins to teach them or talk to them or ask them questions, first, Jesus feeds them. Verse 13, Jesus then cometh and he taketh the bread and he giveth them and fish likewise. John tells us in verse 14, this is the third time that Jesus had showed himself to his disciples after he was risen from the dead. This is their third time with him and Jesus feeds them. Reminds me of when he fed them with the loaves and the fishes the first time, miraculously. John 6, 11, he took the loaves and he gave thanks. He distributed to the disciples, the disciples to them that were set down and likewise of the fishes as much as they would. Jesus again here is here with more fish than you could possibly eat. There's seven disciples in Jesus and they have 153 fishes they've just caught plus the ones Jesus already has cooked on the fire. It's more than they can possibly eat. It's an abundant feast. And then in verses 15 to 17, we reach the questions that Jesus is going to ask. <clears throat> and it goes like this. Peter, do you love me? Let's look at it and then we'll break it apart. Verse 15. So when they had dined, so Jesus fills them up. Now they've been in hiding. It's very possible they haven't eaten in a while. And I think it's really tender that Jesus makes sure they have been fed first. So they had dined and Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? People speculate about what the these are. Some say, well, Jesus is saying, do you love me more than these other disciples? I, I think he's pointing at the fish. Do you like me? Do you love me more than fish? Because remember, he's gone back to fishing. Peter answers at the end of verse 15, he saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. So Jesus saith unto him, Feed my lambs. Verse 16, Jesus saith unto him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. So Jesus saith unto him, feed my sheep. Verse 17, Jesus saith unto him the third time. <laughs> Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter's grieved because he had said unto him the third time, lovest thou me? So Peter said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. And Jesus saith unto him, feed my sheep. Something important to note here before we move on to making application. When Jesus here is saying to Simon, when he says to Peter, he says, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? The word that Jesus is using here for love, as we've discussed last Sunday, there were multiple Greek words for it. The word Jesus is using is agapeo. He says, Simon, son of Jonas, agapeo thou me? Agape love is the highest kind of love. It is self-sacrificing love. It is the kind of love that God has for us. It's the kind of love that God has for you. It's described in 1 Corinthians 13, I recommend you read it. This kind of love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. This kind of love never fails. And so we can perhaps understand Peter's response better when Jesus says unto him, Simon, son of Jonas, agape hail thou me. And he has failed Christ. He has not believed all things. He has not endured all things. And so he responds, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love phileo thee. 
says, Lord, you know that I phileo thee. Phileo love is the friendship love. It's the kind of love that a man has for his closest friends. And so we see the conversation really here that Jesus and Peter are having, where Jesus says, do you love me? And Peter says, not very well. Not very well. But Jesus asks him again, do you love me? And again, the answer comes back, Lord, not very well. And a third time, Jesus says, do you love me? And at this point, he's so grieved, he says, Lord, you know better than anybody that I just don't love thee. I just don't love you very well. But after each of these exchanges, Jesus has a similar command. Feed my lambs and feed my sheep. The lambs is, in, in the Greek, it's, it's, it's different. It's that feed my lambs in the Greek. The first one is more of a tend the young sheep. And the second one, feed my sheep, is, is to care for older sheep. Jesus says, take care of the little sheep and take care of the older sheep. It's interesting that Jesus has moved the analogy here from fishing into shepherding. When he called Simon the fisherman, he said, follow me and I'll make you a fisher of men. But here, he brings him out of the boat, out of fishing, and he uses a shepherding analogy. He's, he doesn't say fish for men. He says, take care of the sheep. It's moved from fishing to shepherding. It's moved from catching to caring. We'll revisit that in just a moment. Let me finish our text before we make application. In John 21, 18 and 19, it's a very unusual portion of scripture, but it's powerful if you meditate on it. Much we could say, I only want to say one thing, and that's about Peter here making a strong finish. He's had a rough go. Did that which he said he would never do. Betrayed by abandoning Christ. But Jesus here, after he says, feed my sheep, then in verse 18, Jesus says, verily, verily, or truly, truly, amen, amen, I say unto thee. When thou wast young, thou girdest thyself and walkest whither thou wouldest. So Peter, you've been young and you've done whatever you wanted to do. Your head's strong. You're a leader. You go where you want to go. But when thou shalt be old, when you've matured some, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands and another shall gird thee and carry thee whither thou would not. This verse 19, if you, if you miss the significance of it, the Bible spells it out for us. This spake Jesus signifying by what death he should glorify God. And in fact, church history tells us that Peter was in fact crucified for the cause of Christ stretched forth his hands, girded by another. But notice that Jesus says, signifying what death he should die, but what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken on this, he saith unto Peter, follow me. You see, when Jesus was crucified, Peter did not follow he ran the other direction. Jesus said, Peter, there's another cross coming for you. Follow me towards it. And Peter did. Peter failed the first time and did not follow Christ to the cross. But the second time he did. Some of the last words we have from the Apostle Peter are in 2 Peter 1.13. He's approaching his martyrdom. 
And he writes to the church. He says, yea, I think it meet or fitting as long as I'm in this tabernacle, as long as I am in this temporary body to stir you up by putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Christ hath showed me. But he said, hey, they're getting ready to kill me. That's okay. Jesus told me that was going to happen. I'm ready. And until it does, I want to stir up the remembrance in you. What's he doing? Feeding Jesus' sheep. He's caring for the ones that are scared. He knows that his death, the death of Peter, is going to be a blow to the church. That it's going to cause fear and anxiety in the hearts of the followers of Christ. Why? Because he lived through it. He knows what it's like to see your leader drug off, falsely accused and crucified, and to be scared and flee. He knows. And so as his death approaches, he says, remember. I'm stirring you up. He's caring for God's sheep. Even as he follows Jesus to his own cross. Here's the application I'd like to make. How does God restore our relationship with him? When we get out of sorts, and, and I, the burden on my heart is that there are at least a few here in the room today or watching on the live stream that would say, my relationship with God is not good. And if Jesus said to you, do you love me? That the best you might be able to mutter is not very well, Lord. How does God restore us when we've gotten very far off the trail? Step one. Fail greatly. You want God to restore your relationship with him? <laughs> the first thing you got to do is mess up real bad. You understand I'm not necessarily advocating that this morning. Amen? But people miss this. I, I, I get involved in counseling people that are struggling a lot. And I would say maybe half the time, maybe more. People have missed this. That the reason you need God to restore the relationship is because you failed greatly. And what people will say to me sometimes is like, God cannot restore this because I have failed so badly. My friends, it's because you failed so badly that you need God to restore you. The failure is not a reason to not get the restoration. The failure is why we need the restoration. That's what the restoration is for. Some people get stuck. And listen, if you're in a place where you felt like, boy, I failed so badly. May I say to you, as a pastor of many years now, you're ahead of a lot of people who are in denial and rejection about how badly they've messed up. Much better to be in an honest place about it than in self-delusion. Which is why it really is step one. Matthew 26 is there in your outline. Peter answered and he said unto him, this is before the crucifixion. This is literally the night before. Peter answered and he said unto Christ, Though all men should be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. I believe he meant that. But Jesus saith unto him, Verily I say unto thee, that this night before the cock crow thou shalt deny me thrice. And Peter argues with him. 
Peter said to him, though I should die with thee, yet will I not deny thee. He said, Jesus, you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I will never. Jesus, wherever you go, I'm going. And boy, did he fail. I'll remind you that Peter saw many miracles. Some people only saw one miracle of Christ or none. Peter had a front row seat to miracle after miracle after miracle. And after all that he had seen, after all that God had done in Peter's own life, he still failed. Peter knew who Jesus was. He was among the very first to really know who Jesus was. Thou art the Christ, the Son of God. Peter knew Jesus. He spent years traveling around with him, listening to his teachings. Peter knew more about Jesus' teachings, probably, than any other person alive. And he still failed. Peter was warned specifically of the danger. He was told exactly how he was going to fail and when he was going to fail. Tonight, before the rooster crows, you will do this. Warned specifically of the danger. And he still failed. How badly have you failed? You seen God work in your life? You know who Jesus is? You read the warnings, maybe a Christian, maybe a pastor, maybe a sermon. He said, I got warned even. And still failed. If that's you, good news. You're on step one. Failed greatly. Step two is to not stay down. Don't stay down. You're going to fail. Me too. Me too. But the secret is not to never fall. It's to get up one more time than you fell down. Just one more. Proverbs 24, I love this. For a just man falleth seven times. And we think a just man doesn't fall. No. A just man falls seven times and riseth up again. The difference is between when you get knocked down if you stay there or not. May I say this to you? You might as well get back up. You say, but I might fall again. Okay. Okay. But if you stay down, the devil's not going to give you a break because you're down. You understand the devil has no honor. He's happy to kick you while you're down on the ground. Don't stay down there and let him kick you. How do we not? I want to give you two thoughts on how you practically don't stay. I say, okay, well, don't stay down. That's, that's, that's great, Pastor. Don't stay down. How do, I, how do I get up? Two thoughts. First one, have a meal with Jesus. I'm super serious about this. I have my coffee with Jesus. Sometimes you need, like seriously, it is not an accident that Jesus prepared a meal for his last, for the, for his last time with the disciples like that and that he prepared a meal for him here. When Elijah was wiped all the way out, before Jesus sent him on his mission and restored him, first he fed him cake. Now, it probably means bread, but the King James translates a cake, and I'm sticking with that. Have a meal with Jesus. Peter is such a great example. He's failed so badly, but when he realizes it's Jesus on the shore, when he realizes that Jesus is available, 
he throws himself over the side of the boat to go have breakfast with Jesus. How did Peter go from this spectacular failure to this victorious end? It didn't start really when he saw the resurrected Christ. It started when he had breakfast with Jesus. How do you go from where you are, if you're knocked down hard, wondering if God has any use for you left, how do you go from there to back to serving him? I believe that it starts with breakfast. You say, but Jesus doesn't want to see me. <laughs> I don't know what you think Jesus' face looks like when he sees you coming. When you go to pray, when you go to read your Bible, when it's like spiritually Jesus sees you coming through the door. What do you think Jesus' face looks like when he sees, oh no, it's him again? No. Look at what the Bible says. Psalms 103. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. For he knoweth our frame. He remembereth that we are dust. We didn't expect to fail. But Jesus was not surprised. He knows what we're like. He knows how you are. I share this story sometimes. It's been a while since I shared it from the pulpit. We go to the emergency room a lot with, with my daughter, with Evangeline. She's six. We go a lot. and I know how to open all the cupboards that you're not supposed to open. Get the supplies out myself. <laughs> we, were in the, we went to the hospital with Heather for some of the chemo stuff. And she was looking for Kleenex. And so I went over to the cupboard. She said, we're not in the children's hospital. Don't just open their cupboards. <laughs> oh, try to behave. We're there in the hospital. And Evangeline knows the drill. We go and they do the tests, they do the things, and then we get to go. But this one, she was, we were not sure if we were going to have to admit her or not. And so they were, we're waiting for test results and there's more things that had to happen. So we, she'd already done all the stuff. They'd drawn blood. She'd been through some painful things. She'd been a trooper, just did so good. And then, um, but then she was, she's done. She hadn't slept at all that night. You know, we're here poking her and sticking her and she wants to go home. And so she starts escalating. And I'm pushing her around the wheelchair because we can't keep her trapped in a room. And so I'm wheeling her around the hospital in the wheelchair just to kind of keep her moving. But she's, normally that kind of keeps her calm, but she's escalating, escalating. And so I'm, I'm talking to him, Fanny, Fanny, like, just calm down, just breathe. We've got to stay a little while longer. And, and every time we'd get in sight of the doors, she would point <laughs> at the exit to the hospital. She'd be like, that is the way to steer the wheelchair, that way. And I'm telling her, no, we, we can't leave. We have to stay. And she's like, She's nonverbal, of course, but I could, it was radiating out of her. <laughs> the, don't tell me we can't go. You've got legs. This chair's got wheels. I can see the door. Don't tell me we can't go. I've seen you push a wheelchair through a door, Dad. I know you can do it. And as she's getting louder and more and more agitated, I'm praying furiously, God, just help. God, would you send her peace? God, why won't you? God, why won't you? God, we're already here. There's already all these terrible things. God, I'm not even asking you for healing. God, I'm not asking for anything big. God, just give her some peace. God, would you just, why, God, won't you quiet her down? God, I know you can do it. Why won't you help my kid? Meanwhile, Evangeline's yelling at me, I know you can get me out of here. Why won't you? And I remember putting my hands on Evangeline's shoulders and looking her in the eyes and saying, Evangeline, I know you don't understand, but if you would just trust me, this wouldn't hurt so bad. And like, as the words are coming out of my mouth, I went, oh no. I had this awful, awful, oh no. Because while she's shouting at me, I'm shouting at God. And I'm saying, if you would just trust me, I know you don't understand. Oh, no. And that was the day I first realized that I am God's special needs kid. 
It was good. It was a good day. Because I'm not mad at Evangeline. Because she doesn't understand. And we can't explain it to her. I try to explain the tests that need to get done and why the tests take so long. That is all way beyond her ability to comprehend. There's no point in even trying. I know because I have tried. And she's like, what is that to me? She doesn't understand. She can't understand. And I know that. And I know that she's hurting. And I know that she's scared. And I know that she's frustrated that I'm not doing the thing that to her seems like the obvious right thing. And so I am not mad. I'm not mad at my special needs kid because she's hurt and scared and doesn't understand. And it was a good day when I realized that Jesus knows that sometimes, that a lot of times, I am hurt and scared and I don't understand. And so I throw a tantrum. <laughs> and Jesus, I do not believe, is mad. I think his reaction is the one that I have when I'm doing better as a father. Because Jesus is a much better father than I am. God is a great heavenly father. And he looks at us and he has compassion for us as we throw our tantrums. Because he knows we're hurt and scared. He knows we don't understand. The Bible says that God pities his children. He has pity for what we're going through. He knows our frame. He remembers that we're dust. So when you failed, don't run away from Jesus. Run towards him. If you're down, I recommend breakfast with Jesus. And secondly, hang on to this truth. How do we not stay down? We don't stay down by remembering that God delights, delights to give us the chance to repair things. Sometimes you maybe are like this and I can be like this. Somebody messes up enough and there's no more chance for them to repair it. We're done. Sometimes that's wise. Can we, can we all just agree that sometimes that's wise? Okay. The Bible requires us to forgive. It does not require us to trust people. If somebody betrays your trust sufficiently and deeply and repeatedly enough, you are unwise to continue trusting that person. Can we all agree with that? Okay, that's biblical. Now, we then try sometimes mistakenly to apply that to God and think, I've done this too many times, too repeatedly, too intentionally. I will not get the chance from God to try again because that's how we would treat one another and probably even should in some cases. But it's not so with God. God delights to give you another chance to try again. He delights to. Micah 7, 18. Who is a God like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He retaineth not his anger forever because he delighteth in mercy. It is a delight to our God to show mercy. And here, in this story of Peter, we find Peter's three denials have now been met with three chances to confess his love. How many times did Peter deny Christ? Three. How many times now again, face to face with Jesus, does he get the chance to tell Jesus that he loves him? Three times. I believe that parallel is intentional by Christ. He says, you deny that you even knew me three times. Now I want you to look me in the face and tell me three times. <laughs> Peter hung on to that. I'll guarantee it for the rest of his life. Because remember before this, before the question, before the question, they're standing around awkwardly unsure of what to say. They don't know what to say to Jesus. Peter is uncertain of what he could say. And if it weren't for the question of Jesus, he might have missed his chance. To look Jesus in the face and tell him he loved him. And not just once, but three times. God delights to give us the chance to repair. So don't stay down. So don't stay down. Run towards him.
Remember that he delights to have mercy. And then finally, step three, begin again. With God, there's not just one beginning. You have the beginning of your story as a Christian, good. Sometimes you just need to begin again. God always gives a path forward. Every time Peter says, Lord, you know I love you, not like I should, not well. But he does love him. And every time he says, feed my sheep. Take care of my lambs. Jesus is not done with Peter. He's got something for him to do. Not only just a fisher of men, I believe that call, the call of God is without repentance. God has already called Peter to be a fisher of men. And I believe that Peter, and obviously Peter continued to do that. But now Jesus has said, and now you have this experience. The sheep need you. Not just to get them saved, but to help them when they fail. To help them when they face these things that you have faced. This is the path of the Christian life. Philippians 3, the Apostle Paul, same thing, was involved in murdering Christians. But what did he say? Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. I have not arrived. But this one thing I do, forgetting the things which are behind and reaching forth unto the things that are before. There's a path forward always with God. With God always a way forward. With God always a way forward. If you have breath in your body, it does not matter what the failures are. If you will come back to Jesus, you can start again. And I'm closing with this. Remember that especially with Jesus, that victory is available after defeat. One of the great lies of the enemy is, oh, you've been in that war and you lost. And anytime you feel like, well, I failed at that, it's dead and done. I want you to remember the cross and the empty tomb. The cross was not the end of Jesus' story. Three days later, he left an empty tomb behind him. Peter's denials were not the end of his time with Jesus. There was still breakfast on the beach and sheep to care for. Closing thought is in Luke 22. It's there in your outline. Before, Jesus before, before Peter betrayed Christ, Jesus didn't just warn him about what he was about to do. Look at what Jesus, the full text of what Jesus says in Luke 22. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you that he might sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee. Knowing what Peter's about to do, Jesus said, the devil's going to shake you hard. Simon, I want you to know, I prayed for you. That thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, it's a great Greek word, epistrepho. Epistrepho, it means turned around. Peter, when you get turned around, when you get brought back, strengthen thy brethren, feed my lambs. They're going to need your testimony. If you're here and you're down and out, oh man, I, uh, this message was for you from Jesus, not from me. And I would say to you, there's people that are going to come through the doors of this church or maybe they're already here. They're going to need you. They're going to need your story about how you... Whew, you knew Jesus and you were warned by Jesus and you saw him work and doing your life and boy, you just nuked the whole thing anyway. 
But then you had breakfast with Jesus and found out he still loved you, that he still cared for you, and that he was delighting to give you mercy. And that even though you don't love Jesus the way you ought to, boy, does Jesus love you. And you can feed some other sheep. After you're converted, once you get turned around, once you get brought back, there is a path forward. Victory is available after defeat. Our brothers and sisters need us to strengthen them. And we do that by having a testimony like Peter's, not of never failing, of failing greatly, greatly, but not staying down and starting again. Sister, if you're able to come and play, and the invitation is very simple. As the piano plays, we'll invite you just to spend a moment and talk to the Lord. Maybe Jesus would ask you a question. Do you love me? And you and I all know that the answer to that question is not as well as we should. Not as well as we want to. But try to listen to the question again. Jesus says, do you love me? Listen, if the answer is yes, then it doesn't matter how badly you've broken down. It doesn't matter how much you've messed up. Jesus, is, Jesus understands that we don't love him the way that we're supposed to. He knows that. He saw the failure. He knows the disappointments. Jesus is not looking for information about how much you love him. That's not what the question's for. It's not for information. It's for your benefit. Boy, I mess up a lot still. <laughs> it's a bummer how much I still mess up. But I hear this question. Jesus, do you love me? And I, I do. I'm so grateful to him. That's why it hurts when I've messed up. That's why I'm sad when I fail. The reason I'm sad is because I love him. And I want to be better. So you can have breakfast with Jesus and get back up and start again. Somebody here needs to do that maybe and I would invite you to use this time of quietness to do that. If you don't know Jesus, if you've never, if you've never started at all, you come talk to us. Let's get, take a Bible and show you how you can know our Jesus. If you need to start again, now's a good time while the piano plays. If not, if right now things are going okay, then good. But maybe ask the Lord, say, hey, plant this in my heart so that I'm ready. Whatever you need to talk to Jesus about, you do that.